Well, welcome back. I didn't really do much of a proper introduction of myself uh, or this meeting, so let me do that now. Uh, I'm Frank Gaffney, the president of the Center for Security Policy. Uh, we are in the midst of a big day uh, with the center. This is the second of two panels, of course, uh, making up a symposium that we've intended to uh, mark a kind of new aspect to our Keeper of the Flame events uh, that uh, will take place later on in the day. Um, this happens to be our 25th anniversary, so we thought that it might be useful to uh, do some substantive uh, work in the morning hours and then prepare for a wonderful program honoring this evening. Now the late uh, Congressman Bill Young, um, General Al Gray, the Commandant of the Marine Corps, the 29th Commandant of the Marine Corps, will also be honored um, this evening. So we've got uh, a lot going on. This is, uh, as I've mentioned, uh, an enormously important uh, topic. Uh, it happens to flow rather nicely from what we were talking about uh, at the tail end of the previous uh, program, namely the question of the resiliency of this country, uh, both its uh, uh, unmanned vehicles, uh, other conventional force capability, uh, nuclear forces, uh, the military establishment more generally, and of course uh, the society itself. I, I would mention that I, I happened earlier this week to uh, uh, be at the world premiere, they called it, of a program that will air on Sunday night on the National Geographic Channel. It's a new film entitled American Blackout. And it um, has as the kind of storyline uh, the effects that we're going to be discussing today, although precipitated by a kind of uh, attack, if you will, a cyber attack that took down the electric grid, according to this uh, story, for 10 days time. I encourage everyone in this room and uh, that will be watching this on video uh, to take a look at this film. It is very well done. It makes persuasively the case that life as we know it will not continue in an environment without electricity. And whether that is caused by a, um, a cyber attack, whether that is caused by a, another sort of a physical attack on the grid, transformers, other parts of the infrastructure, uh, whether it is caused by uh, a natural occurrence, uh, the sun flaring in ways that uh, will precipitate, as we'll be talking about, uh, phenomena very similar to what might most efficiently be done to us by an adversary who understands the vulnerability of this country to the loss of electric power uh, by attacking our grid through a nuclear detonation high above the country that precipitates an EMP event. This film charts through sort of a dramatic um, uh, storytelling the experiences of 10 or 12 individuals through the course of those 10 days. And you witness what happens in their lives and indeed the lives of their communities and, uh, and the country more generally as all of the critical infrastructures go down. To talk about this problem and the danger that we risk if we allow our vulnerability to EMP to persist, we have three uh, individuals very much involved in one aspect or another of uh, uh, this fight uh, over <clears throat> understanding the problem in the first instance, uh, raising awareness more generally, 
and uh, trying to take corrective action to deal with it. I'm very pleased to say we have another distinguished member of Congress, um, also a subcommittee chairman, in this case the uh, chairman of the <clears throat> Judiciary Committee's Constitution Subcommittee. He is also, however, a member of the uh, Armed Services Committee in the House of Representatives and the co-chairman of the EMP Caucus in the House of Representatives. Um, he is a man who I have had the great privilege to get to know and work with closely over a long period of time uh, as he's represented with great distinction the people of Arizona. Uh, and I'm absolutely thrilled to have him with us to talk about this phenomenon of EMP, the, the danger that he believes it represents, and what he is trying to do at the federal level, most especially in this legislature, to uh, ensure that corrective action is taken before it's too late. With that, I welcome Congressman Trent Franks. You're, you're welcome to come up to the mic here or, or do it there as you wish. Thank you very much, and, and I, I appreciate it. You know, I, I know that it is uh, sort of the commonplace uh, effort to try to flatter your host, but let me just say to you that I have the deepest and most uh, affectionate uh, respect for this man because I am convinced that uh, his place is irreplaceable in Washington and that the Center for Security Policy is vital to what we're doing. And I would echo uh, his own words that uh, uh, EMP, in my judgment, I have the privilege now, I think, of being the senior member of the strategic, the, the Nuclear Forces Subcommittee. I've been there 11 years and uh, been on the Armed Services Committee, do a lot of things related to that and have an engineering background. And consequently, you know, people like me try to take a, a pretty close look at what is really dangerous to us. And I agree with Frank that in terms of a, the most serious short-term national security threat, I believe, is, is man-made EMP. And uh, that's something that, uh, you know, alone uh, should be worthy of, of our, all of our consideration. If that's true, then we should be paying more attention to it than we are. Now, I know that a, a lot of people, when they talk about EMP, the first thing they do is to emphasize the significance of a, you know, a, a worst-case scenario. And I'll just, just suggest to you that uh, there have been a number, a number of studies that have been done here to where we know uh, that there is consensus that if a major cataclysmic type EMP event occurred, whether it was GMD or whether it was a, a man-made, a, a high altitude electromagnetic pulse weapon, uh, the results would be devastating to our society. In a, in a worst case scenario, um, it is just almost beyond my ability to describe because almost everything that we do in our country now is somehow dependent or interdependent on electricity. It, it represents I think in the words of Brink Lindsay, he, you know, he talked about um, who knows what kind of a breakdown of civilization may occur, that there's this thin veneer on our civilization. And we're one act of madness away from a social cataclysm unlike uh, any of us have ever known. And so the, the implications here are profound beyond my ability to articulate. And I will just tell you that I am of the opinion that uh, like so many that study this issue, that it will cause society to begin to tear itself apart. Someone said that, uh, Frank, that we're about a dozen meals away from anarchy. And I'm, I'm afraid that's true. We, we're so used to living in the 21st century that we just, don't, we just don't realize where we would be apart from this support mechanism called electricity. And EMP has the ability to take that away from us. And uh, I could speak in more dramatic terms, but I don't know if I can speak in more fundamentally simple terms. Now, this could happen, and if it does, the, uh, the potential for human suffering and uh, total restructuring of our uh, human civilization in this country could occur because of it. Um, it's interesting to note that the military is someone that we never have to argue about on this issue because they understand it better than anyone else. And there's a great dichotomy in the country. Uh, the military hardens our... You know, I, I chair the Missile Defense Caucus as well, and they, we harden our missile defense apparatus in, in a significant way because we know that we may have to fight through uh, an EMP environment. And so that's just a natural thing for the military to do. And we spend significant, we've spent 
hundreds of billions of dollars over the last uh, few decades on hardening this country's uh, uh, triad, on hardening our, our uh, missile defense apparatus and some of our most crucial defense uh, uh, assets to EMP. And this was something that was standard uh, discussion in the Cold War. And yet today, somehow, we still have seen the military go on to protect against EMP, but the civilian grid upon which they depend on for 99% of their electricity is essentially left unprotected. And I find that to be a, a, a something that is not unlike historical accounts in the, in the past. You know, it seemed like uh, people, uh, it seemed like history is replete with examples where intelligent societies overlooked the obvious and, of course, they were unable to control the consequences that followed. I'll give just one because I think it's such a good one in the six, early 1600s. Uh, London had built their homes too close together, didn't build fire breaks, didn't really, weren't really prepared for major fire because did they not know about fire? They, they knew about fire. But somehow, you know, society gets to, to be a little bit proud of its uh, modernity or its sophistication or its advancements of the moment. And we consider ourselves impervious to the obvious. And that's what happened. And 90% of London burned uh, at, the, at a moment when they didn't think that it would, would ever occur. And I'm just suggesting to you that we are not smarter than they were. We may be more educated. We may have some different technologies. But we are not smarter than those people were that allowed 90% of one of the greatest cities in the world to burn simply because they forgot that fire burns wood. And we don't need to make that mistake in our day. And I'm convinced that that's uh, essentially the direction that we're headed uh, where we are right now. But I will say to you that I bring some good news and then I want to talk to you about legislation and I want to sit down. There is a growing traction in the Congress and in the country uh, and a growing understanding of the significance of this issue. And I will also say to you, without flattery, that the Center for Security Policy is at the <coughs> forefront of that growing awareness. And so all of you should be very affirmed in that regard, whatever your involvement here is, and more affirmed uh, to the extent of your involvement. If you're helping financially, if you're helping uh, technologically, whatever you're doing, I promise you, I believe with all of my heart that you are doing something that will portend to help uh, your children and grandchildren walk in the sunlight of freedom. Uh, because as you know, we've said so many times, there is that moment in the life of every problem when it is big enough to be seen and still small enough to be solved. And we are in that window, but I think it's closing quickly. So quickly, what is the threat that we have to, to mitigate? I'm convinced that apart from some type of hardware-based solutions in our grid, that we are failing the test of our time. And that's why we're doing everything we can to see the SHIELD Act passed in the Congress. And we're committed to that end. And uh, yet we're running into some pretty challenging circumstances from the, the industry that doesn't want Section 215 to be altered because they fought long and hard for that. And it's a unique uh, section of the law where um, Federal Energy Regulatory Commission has a very difficult time in regulating the grid because they, that, was, that was the way the law was created. And I would suggest to you that uh, as a Republican, I don't want to regulate any more than is absolutely necessary. But in this case, it's a matter of national security. And so we've had to work around that a lot. And we've had to get legislation to try to further the cause and raise the awareness. So we have two main bills. We have the SHIELD Act, which is the fix. Whatever people will tell you, if we don't do something like the SHIELD Act, we will fall short of mitigating this challenge. But we also have a bill that will be going to the Homeland Security Committee that will expand, I hope, awareness of the issue and hopefully be a vehicle by which we could add more significant uh, uh, provisions, Frank, that would, would, would do something worthwhile. And so I'll just close on, on this, this notion. Um, the only real thing that has to happen for this to become a panic scenario is for nuclear weapons to fall in the hands of non-state actors. Because there are those out there that say, well, you know, no one's going to attack the United States. No one's going to send a, a nuclear warhead above our atmosphere and, and, uh, and try to foster an EMP attack on this country because they know what the result would be. And let's just say for a moment that they're correct. I, first of all, I resent the notion of being that vulnerable. We built a missile defense system to mitigate our vulnerability to nuclear warheads landing in our cities. So why in the world wouldn't we 
deal with something where one warhead could have the kind of impact uh, that it could have with if it were an EMP type of attack. But that's the first thing. But let's say for a moment that they're, you know, that they're, they're right. What happens then when countries are not the issue, when terrorists become the issue, and they don't have this fear of retribution? Because we live in a society today, we live in a, in a time today where we're in a post-911 world where terrorists have demonstrated their willingness to die for their cause. And I would suggest to you that that rewrites the whole notion of deterrence. And if they gain nuclear warheads, um, they don't need anything but a scud and, and, a, and a, a cargo ship to attack this country. And we've given them the perfect scenario to do it. And so it's consequently very, very important that part of this discussion be to make sure that Iran does not gain nuclear weapons. And we're working very hard on that. It is an overall kind of a comprehensive effort to try to secure this country. So let me just say to you that I think, uh, I think all of you are a critical part of this discussion. I hope in the ways that you can, you will encourage your own representatives to sign on to the SHIELD Act and also the Homeland Security Bill that we're going to be dropping here in, in, in imminent uh, time frame. And I hope you won't go grow, grow discouraged because truth and time travel on the same road. It always happens that if you do the right thing, the politics and the, the, the general population will eventually follow, either as a result of their enlightenment or as a result of running into the reality face to face. So be encouraged, and I hope someday, when we're sitting around watching TV or watching a movie, and I say this all the time, that an event so significant will have such a small effect that only a few of us will know what a tragedy was averted. And I think you're going to be among those few. God bless you. Thank you. Uh, Congressman Franks, thank you for exceedingly generous comments uh, about our organization. I endorse them, needless to say, but um, I, I'm a little bit uh, uh, chagrined because I failed to mention that what we're really working on now is pulling together, as we try to do at the center, uh, a team that is actively seeking to help those like <clears throat> Congressman Franks in the state, uh, the Senate, uh, excuse me, the uh, federal legislature, as well as counterparts at state level, and many others uh, in industry, uh, in the media, the academic community, um, the public at large, to both be aware of this problem, which, which he is so properly seized, and to be supportive of the efforts like those he's trying to make to remedy the situation. Uh, we have an EMP coalition that has come together for this purpose. Uh, if you would like more information, I believe there's a, a sheet uh, describing it in your um, handouts. Uh, we have a, uh, a number of members of that coalition who are with us today. Uh, Jake Berman is helping us manage it. Uh, Peter Pry, Dr. Peter Pry with the EMP Commission. Um, is here, and am I missing anybody else? Dr. Michael Del Rosso, our senior fellow at the center, also worked with the EMP uh, Threat Commission, and um, we're very grateful to you all for the work that you do, the expertise that you bring to bear, and the, uh, I think, the support network that is coming together to try to, as Congressman Frank said, uh, actually get this country protected against this threat. Uh, I'm very pleased that we have to describe, in part, uh, issue that uh, the congressman alluded to, namely the ability of our military to contend with this problem and the implications of our failure to do so. Uh, his Brigadier General Ken Krosniak, uh, who has served in uh, the United States Army's regular forces, uh, the reserves and the National Guard uh, for some 36 years prior to his retirement, uh, he is currently uh, on assignment with the U.S. Army War College, where he is an instructor. Uh, but prior to leaving uh, the service, he was for two years, um, uh, what have we got here? Two years, the Chief of Staff to the Army's Asymmetric Warfare Office. 
And again, as I, I think you have gleaned, hopefully from my comments and Congressman Franks, there is no greater asymmetric warfare threat to this country than this one. He also uh, spent four years uh, working with the Joint Chiefs of Staff. So he has a marvelous perspective on this. Uh, I'm delighted to have him with us. And I don't know if we've worked the mechanics of your presentation. I, I hope we have. It'll just, it'll just take us a second to Wonderful. We're going to bring him up and let him with support from Christine Brim, make his presentation. Thank you, General, very much for being with us. Great to have you with us. Yeah, this is just a small, can you hear me okay back there? This is just a small portion over here. I'll, I'll be showing you just as a, uh, as a backup, but I thank you very much. And thank you very much for, uh, sir, for your opening remarks at that strategic level, which definitely you know, at the 30,000 foot level, but it definitely affects the uh, right down to terra firma. And right now, basically, I put these comments together when I was uh, in contact with Ben Lerner. Um, it, w it was great being called to do this because it's been frustrating for the last few years, you know, after giving many, many briefings on EMP and so on and learning from people like Peter Pry and, and uh, Cindy Ayers and Claire Lopez and other, you know, uh, people out there that are, see this clear and present danger. So I, I tried to think about, I was basically asked to comment on what is the EMP's effect on the military's ability to execute missions? Kind of a, a broad one, so I had to narrow it down. I, I narrowed it down to the operational, those that are downrange right now in, in contact up close and personal with bad people, and DISCA, Defense Support to Civil Authorities. I, I stayed with those two because I think that's what is most endearing to my heart, and hopefully yours, ours, yours also, especially defense support to civil authorities. And I brought it from a perspective of, and I, I think you know, those of you that know me, I don't talk about myself too much uh, at all, but I brought back on some of my experiences, my, my enlisted and commissioned time as a military police uh, person, chemical warfare for a number of years, downwind messages, four years with an eight-inch nuclear deliverable uh, artillery uh, group, and uh, quartermaster, officer, I had, no, I had no life, I was single, that's why I got all these uh, duties, nobody else wanted them. And a combat engineer. And uh, I think it gave me a different perspective. So the bottom line up front, I always like the bluff. The bottom line up front, the U.S. military is not prepared to conduct operations nor adequately assist our citizens in the homeland in response to and recovery in a truly catastrophic scenario. While there are surely other areas of concern, my focus will be on what I consider crucial in three areas, training, communications, and the most important element of what we call the DOTLAM FP in the military, the doctrine, organization, training, leadership, material, policy, plans, facilities. People are the most important. Here are some thoughts I'd like to keep in mind that support the bottom line that I want you to think about as I go through my, my, my uh, venting up here. One of the most revered tenets of the Army, and any, any, I'm sure it's the same way on, on Capitol Hill, is the old, age old adage that has worked well, definitely for me, is that you train as you fight. The second one is no matter what rank you are, Private Murphy is in charge and therefore always plan for the worst case situation. Third one is land operations are always conducted, conducted in a VUCA environment. If you don't think it's a VUCA environment, you soon find out about it when, the, when you first hit into Indian country and so on, hitting down range in the convoy. Volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous environments. Much like the, the Congress every day. Yeah, I'm sure. you, you hit it. Surrounded. Yeah. Number four, lack of assured communications will add to the present extreme angst in this VUCA environment. Number, and the fifth one, the last one, when one thinks of the military, we envision a soldier, sailor, airman, marine, merchant mariner. My son's a merchant mariner in the Gulf right now, so I had to throw that in. That's all true, but in actuality, a huge network of infrastructures supports them and makes them all possible. The military installations for training, life support, deployment platforms, government employees seem to have been in the news lately. IR1. The next one is the defense industrial base for supply, resupply, manufacturing, research. They support the military installations. The people that support the entities that support the military installation, the supply chain providers that supply the defense industrial base and all supporting manufacturers. 
The commercial power grid controls everything. Like the congressman said, 99% of our power comes to all of, the, all, of the, all of the previous ones I've talked about from the commercial power grid. And most importantly, families. They control the minds of and influence the most important people. I'll, I'll just mention soldiers. It's easier that way. We'll only be here till noon. General, I, I've got. If, you, if, if, if you don't mind so us hooking this up, up so oh, that you're ready to go when you're ready to go, why don't you just grab a mic here and not push the wrong button okay. and talk to the Kremlin somehow? Sorry about this. Okay, thank you. I can, just, I can just leave it on there then. Uh -huh. Yeah, thank okay, you. Can I just push. I turn the radio on and Maze music comes out. So, uh, first, we first I'll talk about the operating force. That's the that's the force that operates O'Connor's outside the continent of the United States, tasking to engage again, as I said, up close and personal enemies or threats to the homeland or our allies. To do so, we project and sustain a battle-hardened military force globally through split-based operations between the homeland and overseas. To communicate these vast operational distances, warfighters depend on land-based, terrestrial, and space-based technologies to provide mission command. Through robust and secure satellite C2, command and control, communications to employ high-tech sensors and weapon systems. As the colonel here was talking about, remotely piloted vehicles or other unmanned systems on the ground in, in, uh, down in uh, downrange. <clears throat> we rely heavily on power for telecommunication systems and satellites for our critical warfighting functions of protection, sustainment, mission command, maneuver, movement, intelligence, and fires, field artillery fires to conduct, and JDAMs to conduct work the mission. Secondly is the most, our, my most important mission, I think for the military, which the military wasn't completely embracing because they do have a warfighting function, but it's, DISCA, Defense Support Civil Authorities, to aid citizens in our homeland and interact with FEMA when local and state assistance is insufficient. So DISCA works with NORTHCOM, Northern Command, Pacific Command, Army North, National Guard entities throughout the United States and our territories, and all combined, and with, very heavily with FEMA, and work those military command issues uh, that uh, in, for the, both the supported and the supporting entities uh, that need assistance during the, these troubling times. Additionally, each state adjutant general has trained units able to assist as civil support teams, home response forces, and CBRNE enhanced response forces. These forces will not prove sufficient in a truly catastrophic scenario as envisioned by by the Congress's discussion. Remember the plan for the worst case. Totally untrained general purpose forces, these are all of the other forces. A very small section of the forces are trained in chemical, biological, radiological, radiological nuclear enhanced mitigation. In that type of environment, you're gonna, even one CBRNEF, CCF force is about 4,500 people. And I think we only have one that was approved out of the three that the military asked for. But in the QDR of 2010, uh, the administration cut the other two, so that didn't help too much. Untrained, per these forces will be called upon by the president, who will call the SECDEF and said, quote, send me everything you've got when the FEMA resources have been overburdened to reinforce DISCA's mission of medical assistance, search and recovery, decontamination, patient support, heavy logistics, interoperable communications, and engineering operations. These forces will be crucial in truly complex catastrophes are what FEMO calls the maximum maximums to assist our citizens in the homeland. The same is true in DISCA as with, with our downrange forces. They'll require viable and assured communications to find out and make plans and procedures to come back to the homeland and disengage from combat operations when the, like, Honorable Paul Stockton, the past Assistant Secretary of Defense for Homeland Defense and American Security Affairs, talked about it at the War College in July of 2012. He said, they're not going to attack the tip of the spear. We're pretty well battle-hardened military. We, we're, we're doing pretty good. They're going to attack the people holding the spear, us, back in the homeland. As of right now, for regional level type disasters, the likes of Hurricanes Katrina and Sandy, the derecho, 
your military, the NORTHCOM, PACOM, the National Guard Bureau, coordinates well with FEMA, with well-trained teams, and has performed admirably. But these, there's different levels. You can argue that all you want. I talk about an emergency, a disaster. Katrina, Sandy, that was a disaster. You ask uh, someone who owns the, the, uh, a good Cajun food place in New Orleans, if it was something, they'll say it was a catastrophe. Well, it's differing levels, uh, you know, total war and so on and so on. But a truly catastrophic, cataclysmic event, almost to a tragedy, is what, is what, we're, uh, is what I'm aiming for. But they train and use developed scenarios and war games which are exercised regularly. It's important to keep in mind that this has been accomplished with expected and guaranteed land-based terrestrial communications linked with robust satellite-spaced uh, communications ability with MILCOM, military command, military sats, satellites, and commercial satellites, most of them in low Earth orbit. Think for a moment. How effective would rescue and recovery operations have been during Katrina and Sandy in such a degraded or denied communications operational area? They had little to no comms. I, I'll leave that up to you to try to figure out. You can form your own movie like you know, Revolution or The Dome or some of the societal unrest imperatives that will result from that. While we have some emergency level trained forces Exercise regularly, like I talked about, who respond up to the disaster level, it is essential to also train the general purpose forces when the remaining of the, of the tactical and operational forces will be needed. For a truly catastrophic EMP, the military is not prepared, and neither is FEMA or DHS, as there are no substantive planning for such a worst case situation. No scenarios have been envisioned, developed, or exercised concerning support to the homeland involving multiple regions at the same time for prolonged periods of time involving vast urban and suburban areas under a likely severe radiological environment. We have 104 nuclear power plants, but I can discuss that, but you, you don't want to go there. It's in the too hard column. Again, all at the same time. Sprinkle into this ungodly cauldron the fact that we, were, we would be asking our military, who's not trained for this, FEMA, firefighters, law enforcement, medical personnel, and numerous others to deal with this enormous, nat enormous natural or man-made catastrophe in an environment also involving a humanitarian disaster, severe civil conflict and societal unrest, with degraded or denied communications capability among rescue and recovery entities, with no operative financial or medical support system, all within the good odds of a severe radiological hazmat environment, again, all at the same time. It's important now that you let it sink in that your military is inextricably, inextricably linked to the very same commercial grid and critical infrastructure that you are right here in your home or business. Just as you, they need support from telecommunications, transportation, banking, finance, Petroleum refineries, natural gas, food, water, space, I can go on and on. You know, you know all of these entities or you wouldn't be here right now. Satellite systems, insulin for their loved ones, and emergency service to name just a few. Thank you. I'm going to go ahead and show just a clip from uh, Craig Fugate that uh, I've been I timed it to 15 minutes, but I think I messed up. Again, plan worst case situation, right? <laughs> Sorry about that. He had put this out uh, some time ago. I think it was maybe about a year and a half ago. And it shows, this is for an example, a G5 extreme geomatic storm. It could be an EMP from a uh, uh, North Korean weather satellite coming from the south up to the north with a one kiloton payload on it. But it, just 12 to 24 hours, and it shows down here on the bottom the relative effects all the way from <coughs> on the impact, minor up to uh, severe. And that's just after 12 hours, and it affects the low Earth orbiting, mid Earth orbiting, and geosynchronous orbits, all of them inextricably linked. That the POTS is a, this is a plain old telephone system. Um, things are simple at FEMA. Um, it has to be there. And on the tactical side, you can see the fire, the, fire, the cell towers, the fire companies, the, the, the police, the law enforcement, the EMS. Uh, and over here is the tactical side down the terrestrial uh, for the land combat forces that are operating right now. Here it is after eight hours. 
There's been some degradation already, especially the telephone systems after eight hours. Numerous cellular towers begin to fail. Backup battery fa fails in homes and offices, unless you've got a couple thousand gallons of fuel under the ground. HF communications intermittent. After three days, backup power begins to fail without fuel supply. Don't forget the refineries um, are shut down also, or compromised. Surviving satellites may be usable, those that haven't been scintillated. Without fuel or water after eight days, there's a considerable compromise because widespread failure, the cloud fails. And it wouldn't, it, the, the public service network cannot talk. So if, if FEMA's having problems, they put this slide out, if FEMA's having problems with connectivity, how are we going to talk with them since we, many of our systems are hardened, like, like the congressman said, many of our systems are hardened, but our nuclear system, I have no fear there. Their nuclear systems, the SATCOMs and the MILSATs, they, there's no fear of compromise. We can have a retaliatory capability in our BMDs and so on for offense or for, and for defense. And after 30 days and beyond, everything shuts down, except HF radios, line of sight, anything BLOS, anything beyond line of sight may not be viable, but, you just, but, but that affects us. It's still, you have condensed distances. Even if you're overseas operating in a combat zone, you have to take regular other troops and put them into ISR, intelligence surveillance, especially if you're going to move into contact. You have to know, uh, you don't want to be uh, uh, unpleasantly surprised because you don't have all the data, so you have to actually reposition your forces. That'll be in the extreme during a cataclysmic event such as assisting in DISCA. I'm gonna wrap it up with just one, a couple of sentences. We have to, it's very simple, train, exercise, number one, have, have DHS devise exercises, scenarios, plans, have them exercise by Northern Command and Pacific Command and our North and National Guard personnel who will be, who'll be out there in these life-saving uh, uh, venues and just start training the general purpose forces because the forces we have right now are not sufficient in the amount of numbers of casualties and so on alone, medical, uh, to uh, assist our fellow civilians. I talked with a typical New York uprate, up New York, upstate New York rate of speech. I hope you understood me well. Um, the commanders I briefed hardly understood me, and worst of all, the people that I was in charge of for a while, they don't, didn't understand me most of the time either. But uh, thank you. Thank you, thank you. General, thank you very much. Uh, obviously, you've, um, you've added a lot of texture to the generalized warning that uh, Congressman Franks provided. We're going to ratchet this down even further now to give you a sense of what this kind of catastrophe looks like at the state level, uh, both to give you a sense of how hard a problem it is to remediate. In fact, I would argue it's impossible to remediate after it's happened. And therefore, how imperative it is that we do everything we can to prevent it from happening in the first place. Our final speaker is a man who has wrestled with these kinds of issues for a long time uh, in the United States Air Force. He was uh, involved, among other things, in the joint operations planning business uh, at United States Joint Forces Command. He retired from the military, uh, but not before being uh, the adjutant general of the state, uh, the Commonwealth, forgive me, of Virginia, um, in which capacity, is, of course, he had the responsibility for being the first line of defense in the event of natural disasters or calamities affecting the Commonwealth. And um, unfortunately, during his tenure, that happened with some regularity, but not on this scale, and really nothing quite comparable. Um, so we've asked General, uh, Major General Robert Newman, uh, who is, I'm very pleased to say, working with Michael Del Rosso and, and others of us in this EMP coalition, to see what can be done to use Virginia as kind of a test bed for what can be done, not just at the federal level where Congressman Franks is working, uh, not just with the military uh, where uh, 
uh, General Kozniak has been active, but at the state level as well, and show, as has been done recently, importantly, in the main state legislature, that this may be one of the places of the, the incubators, as federalism has it, the incubators of solutions, uh, the kind we very definitely need at the moment on EMP. General, welcome. Glad to have you with us. Thank you, Frank. Congressman and uh, General Krozenak, it's good to be with you, and thank you for your remarks, which really tee up uh, what I want to, to address today. Uh, I have several points I'd like to, to share with the audience today. The first, I want to discuss uh, the National Guard. And the reason I want to spend a few minutes talking about the Guard is I find that the vast majority of Americans uh, don't really understand the Guard uh, and its, its dual mission that it has and how uh, at the state level it is a vital resource for the governor in any emergency, whether it's a, an EMP or whether it's a flood or, or anything that uh, would threaten the citizens of the state. Uh, secondly, I want to spend a little bit of time on the EMP threats and then uh, lastly talk about the uh, challenges that this spe specific type of event uh, uh, pre presents not only for our military that General Kroisniak talked about, particularly with the NORTHCOM interface and things such as that, but also with, uh, uh, with the National Guard. Our, nation, our nation's National Guard is the oldest military organization in the United States. It was originally the militia. You look back and you see the guys banging the bell when the Indians come and they rally to the, to the center at the fort there and bring in their muskets and things. That was the militia. You see the clapper going off at 2 a.m. in the morning and they're putting out a fire down the hall. You know, it, that's the militia that was responding. These are guys that have day jobs. They were farmers, they were shopkeepers, but when threatened by a disaster for their community, they grabbed their muskets or whatever weapon was at, uh, at their disposal and they came and they responded under the command of the local authorities. Just like today, we have day jobs. I spent uh, most of my career before I was put back into active service after the attacks as an institutional uh, bond trader. Uh, and I did that just as uh, guys in the past did other things uh, in the civilian world. The Guard has two roles. The first is to re be a reserve component of our nation's military. This is where most people think of the National Guard today. They hear of National Guard units in their local communities going out the door to Afghanistan and Iraq to fight right alongside the active duty force. But the other side is to serve under the command of the governors of the 50 states, the District of Columbia, uh, the, I believe we have uh, two territories in the Commonwealth of Puerto Rico. So we have 54 adjutants general that respond on command of their governors to assist in emergency response in their state. And most recently, uh, the Guard has had a number of different activities uh, in emergencies such as Katrina and uh, operations at the northeast quarter with Sandy. But uh, most folks think of the Guard as a military force. We are, in fact, that. We use equipment that is paid for by Uncle Sam. Congressman, thank you. And uh, we use that, uh, that equipment that, that is, <laughs> is federally funded, and we use our training dollars, also federally funded, to enable us to operate that equipment as a reserve component of the active duty, but also in the dual use so we can turn those talents and those, uh, those uh, training uh, nodules that we have into assisting our fellow citizens during an emergency. Now, all of this occurs very routinely for the Guard. We train uh, with both missions throughout the year, but it comes to mind, and, and Ken was talking to this, what happens if one day we come up and we don't have the ability to respond to an emergency for whatever reason? Now, the Guard relies on the infrastructure of our country to train and also to get to the emergency and to function during an emergency. The critical infrastructure that we have, the roads, the telecommunication lines, uh, the ability to replenish our, our fuel, our, the food for our troops when they're on, on missions, things such as this, we all take for granted. Uh, but the most important aspect that uh, the two gentlemen have spoken about before is power. And what do we do if all of a sudden power leaves, uh, leaves our, uh, our backlog here, our backpacks? It dramatically impedes our ability not only to respond, but also to conduct missions in, uh, in that response effort. We, uh, we work with a commercial power grid. With the exception of a few backup generators, the National Guard in every state gets all its power to put in for our communications, for our satellite link-ups, for our uh, TV setups, for everything to power the generators that pump the gas for our trucks. Everything has gotten through the commercial 
power structure. So when that leaves us, our ability to get to the emergency is dramatically reduced, and then once we're on scene, our ability to conduct operations is grinding to a halt quickly. Now, our electric grid is integrated uh, throughout the United States and is tightly connected. This increases efficiency, decreases the cost per kilowatt hour, but it also increases our vulnerability. So it's a mixed blessing. What we've seen in recent years, particularly in the Northeast uh, corridor here, is if we have a failure, under the wrong circumstances, and Ken, you mentioned Murphy, so if Murphy's sitting on our shoulder and things are going bad, we can see how one imploding transformer can create a ripple effect throughout an entire region that brings down the northeast corridor to a to blackout. Now, all our planning that we do to relieve whatever emergency is in progress uh, relies on immediate action by the National Guard. We have units there that go out the door within two hours to any place in the Commonwealth of Virginia. And uh, we have that taken for granted as the, not only the citizens expect the Guard to be there, but our emergency responders at the local level, well, the state level too, for that matter, have in their plans that the Guard will be on the scene first, not only to be eyes and ears as to what is required, but also to provide immediate relief from impending danger that threatens lives and property. Now, the EMP changes all of this, whether it's uh, generated from a solar flare or whether it's a, a high altitude electronic magnetic pulse uh, rendering uh, the United States useless from a nuclear attack at altitude, the results are the same. We become stationary in our movement, we become blind in our communications, and we lose our ability to work effectively in the missions that we train on regularly to, to relieve suffering of our fellow citizens. Now, this is not a dream of some survival coop that wears, uh, wears tin foil around the around the bathroom of his house, you know, trying to talk to the Martians as they land. This uh, reality is now upon us from noted scientists as well as businessmen who share the concern that this is not a one in a million shot, but an actuality, an e inevitability that will affect our country and our society perhaps within the next 20 years. Now, although this is acknowledged at the highest levels, General Krosniak mentioned that, Congressman Franks mentioned that, we take for granted that uh, our society as a whole below our national command authority will continue to function in the event of an EFP. That is not the case. I can tell you that I have spent now since, I guess it's been 10 years, 11 years since I was mobilized and came back on active duty, I have seen preparations at the national level at the National Guard Bureau at the Pentagon. I have uh, been an assistant Homeland Security Advisor to Governor Mark Warner and as Adjutant General to Governor Tim Kaine, None of these planning scenarios ever crossed our desks. And I left, uh, I left uniform service uh, three years ago. So unless something has happened over the last three years, which I don't think it has, we remain vulnerable as a National Guard to fully respond to an event caused by an EMP and then to carry on operations once we're on duty. One of the things that concerns me in addition to this is the scope of a possible EMP event. Uh, where we have uh, seen in recent days rather localized events such as Hurricane Sandy, localized meaning within a couple states or what have you, where Katrina hit with Mississippi Gulf Coast and Louisiana being the predominant uh, receptors of that hurricane, an EMP event could, because of the ripple effect, have an effect across an entire region. And imagine 20 or 30 states affect, affected by a total blackout causing disruption in and everything we know normal in our society today. To say the least, that uh, the guards of those states being first on the scene would be dramatically impacted. But what about the coordinated effort for follow-on forces coming from the United States Northern Command or through EMACs, the emergency assistance compacts that the states have among each other to send forces? It's going to be an extremely challenging operation and one that I would submit would not be successful or at least have the outcome which we have come to expect from the National Guard when it shows up on scene. Now recently, this past August, General Michael Hayden, who as we all know is a former director of the National Security Agency and uh, also the CIA, revealed quite publicly that I, in his, uh, uh, his learned opinion, our country had no plans to effectively defend society against an EMP. Uh, he said, and I quote, we had meetings, we realized that this is a really hard problem, and we finally decided that we needed to meet again in a couple months to discuss it. Now this, this approach to uh, the solution of providing relief for, uh, from an EMP reminds me of a warning that we all know that hope is not a strategy. 
And that's what we're doing regarding an EMP. We're sitting back and crossing our fingers and hoping that this doesn't hit. And the cost of securing our electric grid against an EMP is not an insurmountable sum. Estimates have ranged from hundreds of million dollars to protect the grid against a solar storm to approximately $2 billion to secure the grid against a high-altitude EMP. Now, while neither sum is trivial, and I don't expect anyone to, to, try, uh, to expect this to be funded overnight, it certainly is affordable to a country like the United States that has come to depend on electricity to power every aspect of our modern life. Now, also, when we view the, uh, these costs uh, in, in light of the cost of recovery from an EMP, uh, it's, it's trivial in nature. Some estimates say that just in the first month alone, the first four weeks after an EMP event, costs could range between one and two trillion dollars. Mm -hmm. So match that against the cost of building a system that's redundant or that is shielded against an EMP, and you can see that a penny saved today is certainly worth or the pain that we'd suffer down the road if we turn our head. Now let's compare that against a Northeast blackout. In 2003, 50 million people in the Northeast corridor were blinded because of that transformer cascading effect that went down through, uh, throughout the Northeast corridor. They lost power for only two days. 11 people lost their lives due to the blackout, and the economic damage was estimated to be at $6 billion. Two-day uh, two event happened there. Now, Katrina, down in uh, the southeast corner of the United States, caused 80 to $100 billion, $100 billion in damage as a comparison. So you can see the importance of electricity, not only to preserving life as we know it, but also to our economic uh, well-being as a nation. Uh, we as a nation, to echo General Kroisniak, we need to prepare for this. We need to do this not only at the national security level with the national command authority and our military, but also to bring it down through the state level. And um, as Frank was mentioning, I'm involved with, with Michael and with, with others to actively bring the Commonwealth of Virginia into to the forefront on this, not only because of its, its relationship to the national capital region and the byproduct that uh, would, would b benefit the nation as a whole if we do it, but also because I enjoy watching ESPN on the weekends. And a weekend without sports in my household is going to be a tragedy I don't look to, to have to endure. So I hope for all the right reasons that this uh, does gain, gain uh, traction, and uh, I appreciate uh, very much uh, Congressman Frank's leadership in the Congress. I know it is an uphill battle, particularly against the lobbies that seem to thwart every right move that we have up there. But it is a mission that we can't fail to conclude. The Guard will be there. It's a question of whether or not we will be effective. And without the proper training and preparations for this, I submit that the Guard could simply be another set of casualties along the way without uh, heads up in a, in a proper way ahead uh, on the topics of preparation to defend against EMPs. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you. Thank you, General. We've got uh, time for a, 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 at least a few questions, and I'm really uh, grateful to all of you for illuminating different pieces of this uh, particular problem. Uh, if, if I could just toss one out to get started, um, one of the things that uh, you alluded to, General Newman, at the very end of your remarks uh, that uh, I'd like maybe each of you to address, but certainly most especially you, uh, Congressman Franks, um, the obvious candidate for working this problem would appear to be the electric industry, which you'd think would have as great a stake as anybody in ensuring that their infrastructure wasn't cratered. Uh, the regulatory agency that you referred to, Congressman Franks, uh, in Section 215, I think it is, uh, the North American Electric Reliability Corporation, or NERC, is having a, an exercise uh, to test a sustained blackout uh, over large parts of the United States in the middle of November. It's called Grid X2. And I just wonder if you would speak, uh, Congressman, and again, anybody else you'd like to, to the extent to which you expect that to be a faithful representation of the vulnerabilities that you've just described, and more to the point, whether you're getting any help from the industry in alleviating the dangers that are so palpable. Well, I guess, pull that a little closer. We're here? Yeah. I guess the first thing I would suggest to you is there may be some distinction between the actual industry and NERC. 
Uh, NERC represents industry and uh, is written into the statute related to the 215 uh, section that Frank d alluded to. But the, the reality is that uh, NERC uh, as an association has been extremely unhelpful. Uh, I've been uh, astonished uh, at uh, some of the lack of response that we've received from them. Um, NERC was in our office uh, and had signed off on the SHIELD Act. And uh, we, were, we were all going down in one big happy family. And then the, they changed their mind dramatically uh, without any uh, real understanding as to why. And I'm just being extremely candid here. It'll probably get me in trouble uh, because I know there may be even people in this room that uh, would take issue with that. But that has the tragic disadvantage of being the truth, what I just told you. Um, and the, uh, the letters that we wrote to them saying, you know, what, uh, what has changed? Uh, we got back... Uh, letters, something along the lines, well, NERC is an association like, like it was part of their description of the organization saying absolutely nothing. So this has been a, a disappointment to me and I, I, I know that perhaps, uh, you know, when people elected me they realized I wasn't a diplomat and because uh, that I've just demonstrated that I'm afraid all too well. But the, the reality is until we're able to overcome whatever it is that the resistance is, and I believe it has to do with the industry's unwillingness to to change the architecture of Section 215 because they essentially are completely um, insulated uh, from regulation uh, of any consequence. And that doesn't bother me so much except as it occurs in a national security uh, threat. And, and then, that, then that, does, that is something that concerns me. And I think that as we go, the industry will begin to realize the liabilities that they face and that uh, they, you know, they're, they're people too. They want their children and grandchildren to be safe. And I think somehow we just have to, to be wise in how we bring them along. And, and, and I know that uh, people like me have added to a little bit to the adversarial relationship that seems to have grown up among us. But uh, I think it's still very, very important to speak clearly to the issue and then still try to appeal to their humanity to say, all right, if this is not a problem, help us understand why it isn't. Mm -hmm. That's all we've asked them. And uh, I've... Um, reached out on a number of different uh, groups like that, and sometimes we just are astonished at the lack of response that we get. Anyway, I don't want to over-answer the question. General Newman? I would echo the Congressman's frustration. I can tell you from discussions with uh, <clears throat> different utilities, some large, some small, two things come to mind. First, I think that there is a feeling that, or at least there is an expression, and Congressman, tell me if you, if you get in or this or wrong, but that they feel like that they're adequately prepared that they feel like they have uh, enough to, to sustain an attack of, uh, and I'm not an engineer, so some of you guys or gals help me, but so many splooges of uh, VMP stuff that comes forward. But uh, when you press them, it doesn't go but an inch deep. And, uh, That's exactly right. Yeah, and, and so it doesn't stand the test. The other side, uh, I think uh, I've heard this from some folks that uh, they think the cost is going to be significant. And if not a, a dollar and cents cost that's, uh, that's charged to them, which obviously they'll pass on to the consumer, I would guess, the other side is that they're downtime in making these changes. Now, these are arguments that engineers have told me are, are not true, but yet this is what I've heard, and it, it's frustrating because uh, – I come at them as friends. You know, I'm not acting as an official capacity. I have worked with a, a lot of local emergency managers. And Frank, I'll tell you one of the tractions that I've gotten is sharing this threat with our local emergency management team that understands that their fire engines aren't going to get there in time, and when they do, there'll be nothing to, uh, to deliver. I mean, it, it is a, a, an a education process that I think is worth having. But those are two things I hear from the industry, and uh, it doesn't seem to wash with the challenges I've heard. I, I don't want to, just, just the quickest uh, uh, amplification of what he's saying. I think he's hit on the, in, the problem entirely. There's a, a sort of a, a denial that occurs because when you ask the people uh, wh what makes you think you're prepared, uh, they don't cite, well, we tested transformers at this kilovoltage. They don't do any of these things. They just say, well, we just, kinda, we just have a good feeling about it. And uh, so that's, that's the, the concern. Can I just add one point on this? That it's it's my understanding that um, there have been now five different studies by various federal agencies, including the uh, Congressional EMP Threat Commission that I mentioned earlier. Um, all five of which have confirmed that this is a real problem, right. indeed a potentially catastrophic one. The one outlier on this is a study commissioned by the NERC. 
um, that seems to think that uh, operational techniques alone will solve the problem. So I think you're absolutely right that um, they think they've got it licked. But I, again, I, I hope maybe before we're done we can um, visit about uh, the importance of making this upcoming exercise an authentic demonstrator of what kind of problems there are. Not having, as I think was done with this study, in-house, you know, um, a cooked book operation, which would mislead people into thinking there is no problem. Yes, sir. Please identify yourself. Yes. Preston Knoll, Tradition, Family, and Property. Um, regarding the recent slim down, it seems that the Kentucky kickback of $2 billion managed to slip through pretty easily. If you all know what I'm referring to. It's the $2 billion ban in Kentucky that is in Mitch McConnell's home state. And my question is uh, to Congressman Franks, anybody else who'd like to, to take a, a swing at it, um, when I hear these kinds of stories about these little things that you get, you get these commissions that don't want to do it, I'm, am I, am I uh, paranoid to think that there may be something partisan going on there? You know, behind the scenes that, that, that some of these people are getting undue pressure from the administration perhaps not to go ahead with this? Maybe that's just a completely far-fetched question, but it doesn't seem to make any sense. Do you have any thoughts on that, Congressman? Well, I, I don't think your, your question is far-fetched at all. Uh, I will have to say to you that I don't know what, uh, how it would specifically apply here. Uh, but uh, unfortunately, it just seemed like uh, this is one of those that I've had difficulty in, in our own leadership in Congress. Now, the leadership that we have in terms of Mr. Boehner, Mr. Cantor, they seem to recognize the problem. But some of the relevant committee uh, chair, uh, leadership uh, seems to have had a conversion in the, actually, the exact opposite wrong direction. And I, I don't know what, I, don't, I can't get an answer. And I'm just, there's something there of a political nature or, or an issue. And I really failed to answer Frank's question last time as far as the, the um, test that this, that's going to be, this grid X text that, test that's going to. Uh, I, I think that he's exactly right. We need to be paying attention and say, okay, show us that you really do mean this situation. And I can tell you, you know, I told you earlier I had an engineering background. If somebody can tell me that they've got this problem handled, if somebody can show me that this isn't a challenge to my children and yours that it seems to be, I will go away. You know, I have other things I can do. Mm -hmm. But it's like uh, the chairman of the Intelligence Committee said about um, the whole issue with uh, uh, cybersecurity. He says, if you understand the problem, you have a moral obligation to try to do something about it. And this is cybersecurity to the ultimate degree. In fact, it is a cyber threat, Absolutely. according to the doctrine the of side. most of these folks. Uh, we've got a couple of other um, folks who want to be recognized. Let me just ask one further quick question on this that, that goes to the issue of um, perhaps this involvement of politics. Uh, each of you have, in a way, touched on the possibility that we might have a non-man-caused precipitating event, uh, a solar flare, a coronal mass ejection, what have you, uh, that would have, at least in part of the spectrum of EMP, um, the same uh, impact as, as a nuclear weapon designed, uh, detonated uh, above the Earth. I understand that the Obama administration, which is not all that interested in the nuclear piece of this, um, because after all they're going to rid the world of nuclear weapons, um, that's a joke. Um, it's not our joke, it's, it's their joke, but uh, they are, I gather, becoming increasingly concerned that this uh, naturally occurring phenomenon is, is something that really has to be worked. Have you seen any evidence of that yes. among your colleagues so far, Congressman? Yeah, I don't mean to, to hog the microphone here, but yes, we have seen that. That's, that's something that's not as uh, current as you might think. I mean, it's been happening quite a while. They, they clear back the, the days of the GRID Act, they were addressing this GMD, this geomagnetic disturbance, but uh, they didn't address the nuclear, uh, uh, the high altitude uh, nuclear burst issue at all. So we wrote, I, I wrote a letter from the Armed Services Committee, had it, Almost all of the senior members of that committee signed on to this letter. And the beautiful part was the, the uh, Energy and Commerce Committee looked at this and they said, you know, you're right. We, they put it in the bill. We're happy. The bill goes to the floor, passes unanimously. And then there's this unbelievable epiphany that occurred that all of a sudden this is not a big deal. And that's the part that leaves me still scratching my head. Yes, sir. Bruce Brockman with TechSec. Apparently this is not a new phenomenon. 
uh, my company, uh, TechSec, uh, before my time, several years ago, was apparently hired by DARPA or somebody at DHS to take a look at the cyber issues associated with the uh, utility systems. And over two years, they did a study of the SCADA systems and wrote a plan for how to secure those systems, but received apparently no cooperation from the utilities in implementing that. And whether it was a dollars and cents thing or what, I, I really don't know. I could get that information if it would be of value. Mm -hmm. I, I think it would indeed. Anybody wish to comment on that? If not, just that I think that the insurance industry is probably going to be the thing that will open this up and cause the industry to really look at it because they're going to recognize their, their liabilities. Let, let me just add on that, Congressman. I've been uh, talking, because of my background in the financial services area, to the rating agencies. And this is affecting, well, we've discussed this with Moody's and Fitch and S&P, uh, not at the highest levels, but throughout, the, and it reflects what the congressman is saying, that this is actually, a, this is a threat to a business's operation. So just as they rate uh, insurance protection against floods and things and continuity of operations in the business area, they're now starting to think, you know, gee, this EMP could really shut down, and if it hits you here, what does it do to your ability to conduct business? They've got shareholders. They've got to, to generate income to protect them. So if you're not protecting your source, uh, your services or production methods or whatever from an EMP, then we're going to downgrade you from a triple A to a double A. That could be a catalyst to add more fuel to the fire, but right now they're just talking about it. There's not a lot of energy there. If I may just add this, uh, the outlier study that I mentioned that uh, the NERC came up with has had uh, a subsequent study that is, again, independently arrived at that contradicts its, uh, its assessment done by Lloyd's of London. And uh, they've concluded that if a coronal mass ejection of a size comparable to the one that took down the Quebec grid in 1989 were to occur, which they say is a certitude at some point, in the not too distant future, probably, um, 20 to 40 million Americans would be without power, many of them between Washington DC and New York City for up to two years. And the chairman of the commission that Peter Pry and, and Michael Del Rosa worked on, uh, Dr. William Graham opined that if we had a widespread blackout of that size or worse um, for just a year, nine out of 10 Americans would be dead. So this is a serious problem, needless to say. And I, I just wanted to make the point that I think in addition to the rating agencies, which is a, is a great play, and the insurance companies adding to premiums if you don't make resiliency part of your program, there are, we believe, and the EMP coalition is very interested in connecting with them, a lot of industries who will appreciate that even a short disruption in their power supplies will be catastrophic to them. Uh, data centers come to mind. The finances, financial industry is another example. Yes, sir. Has there been Would you identify yourself, please? Uh, uh, Maury Amitad, the National Security Consulting. Has there been... Uh, Hold the mic a little, a little more directly at your mouth, if you would, Maury, please. Has there been... Like this? Not like that? Like this? There has you there go. been bipartisan support for the SHIELD Act and uh, for the caucus? Now you're embarrassing me. Uh, the reality is the answer is yes. In fact, some of the Democrats have been more open to this than some of our Republicans. And it's really, uh, and they'll be able to tell you the genesis is that they have absolutely no hesitation to regulate any, any industry into the Stone Age. Uh, so, so they have no backdrop, they have no pushback. Uh, but yes, and I'll get, tell you one, uh, Senator Markey, is, uh, you know, he was uh, one of the main uh, forces behind the GRID Act early on. And uh, so, yes, they're, they're Garamendi. Uh, uh, these are not people that I consider blood brothers, uh, but uh, they, they certainly are committed to this issue. And I think that's going to be vitally important to us, especially when we get into a Democrat Senate. So it's not a partisan issue. Uh, the, the thing that stopped the GRID Act was the discussion over cybersecurity because senators you know, I hear that they have larger egos than, than most people are born with, and consequently they had different strategies on how to deal with cyber, and that's what bollocked up uh, the original GRID Act. But in some ways, uh, I, I think maybe the law will work out okay if we go forward, because the GRID Act, as good as it was and as strongly as I supported it, still did not really solve the problem. 
and the, the SHIELD Act, without any arrogance whatsoever, it does deal with the problem. If we have the SHIELD Act in place and it's implemented, we will be able to prevent this cataclysmic issue. It doesn't mean we'll solve all the ancillary issues with EMP. That's a, that's a big project. But at least as a society, we will continue to function and we will be maybe dealing with inconveniences rather than a cataclysmic meltdown. Senator, I can't imagine anybody faulting you for not being diplomatic, but let me just add that one of your other That's another joke. one of your other colleagues uh, uh, who has exhibited bipartisan support for this effort is, of course, your co-sponsor Yvette Clark from New York, a liberal Democrat from New York. Um, I believe we are at the end of our time together. I can't believe it uh, has gone so fast, but um, I hope that between these two panels, we have helped illuminate some really important national security policy and technology challenges uh, in a way that will inform both you and uh, those joining us through the miracle of uh, the videotape and YouTube, uh, but more than just inform you, uh, to encourage you to become engaged, uh, most especially, most immediately, if you can and will, with our EMP coalition. There's information about it in this packet. You can also find out more at stopemp.org. Uh, I want to thank our presenters today, uh, General Krosniak, uh, Congressman Franks, uh, General Newman, uh, for a terrific and very informative discussion, um, and one that I hope will encourage you all to, as the Bible says, go forth and multiply. Thank you.